Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad you've decided to join us. We're studying the Sabbath School lessons. It's a series of lessons prepared by the Sabbath School Department of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we're covering the material for the third quarter, that is from July to September of 2012. During these 13 weeks, we'll be studying the, first and se the books of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Last week, we talked about some of the background, what was going on in the, in the city of Thessalonica when Paul arrived there. But today, we're going to talk about the first chapter of Thessalonians. So if you grab your Bible and open up to 1st Thessalonians, we'll study together. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you that you inspired your friend Paul to write down these words and make them available to us so that we can study them and learn from them. May this opportunity bring us closer to you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as usual, Paul begins his address to the Thessalonians with lots of the best things he can possibly think of to say about this group of people. I think that's a great way to start. Yeah. Um, in this case, he starts out by talking about their faith, love, and hope. He told the Thessalonians that he had been praying for them constantly, and he was so thankful that their lives gave evidence of the life-changing power possible through the Holy Spirit, despite the fact that they lived in a pagan and a corrupt society. Try to imagine that you yourself had grown up in Thessalonica as a pagan, attending drunken festivals to the idol gods. But now you have heard about and been converted to Christianity, and your friends are asking, what happened to you? What would you say? How would you convince them that your life had changed for the better? How about that? Well, some people think if you don't drink alcohol anymore, your life is not better. If you don't party every weekend. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. sometimes, you know. How do you convince someone that you, what, the way you're living is better? They think they're partying and having fun. Well, basically. You aren't having any fun. Well, they see you happy, and they don't understand that, but. They don't want to give up their wine, so. Can't figure out why you don't have a hangover, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it gets back to the, uh, what we've talked about earlier, a loving and lovable Christian. And we're living in a time in this world when health matters are on every newspaper and magazine. Yes. You can take advantage of that. I'm living a life that I'm happy with. I'm, my health is better. All kinds yeah. of ways you it can use that. probably won't convince them the first time you talk to them. Now it takes a while, but people watch. People mm -hmm. watch. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, many of the pagan cult religions of those days had dying, rising saviors of various kinds. Some of them died and rose again supposedly every year. But unfortunately, no one actually seen it happen. <laughs> How, what a strange occurrence, right? Does, that fact, does the fact that Jesus died and rose to life and was witnessed physically by hundreds of people, does that set Christianity apart? Absolutely. It certainly does. The new believers had cl clearly come to believe that Jesus had not only risen from the dead, but also that he was coming back to take them back to heaven with him. So, you know, we're thinking about you know, you, you tell your friend who still believes in the Kabiros cult that we talked about last week, and he says, you know, we think Kabiros is coming back and he's going to do this and this. And you can say, I can tell you about somebody who literally rose, died, literally rose to life. Not only that, he's not just going to come down and make things better here. He's going to take me to live in the perfect place where he lives in heaven. And also when Jesus went back to heaven, he sent the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to help us on the earth in the meantime. So we have supernatural help until that time. So why does Paul in this passage in 1 Corinthians, and this, this is something to think about, we're going to get to it more at the end of our lesson, why does he in this passage talk about the wrath to come? 
Can we read the passage? Well, yeah, we'll, we'll get to it later. Oh, well, okay. we can read it now. It's fine. Look at that in First Thessalonians, the, the, the last couple of verses, 9 and 10 there. Um, and I'll, well, I'll read 9 and 10. All those people speak about how you received us when we, we, we visited you and how you turned away from idols of God to serve the true and living God and to wait for his son to come from heaven, his son Jesus, whom he raised from death and who rescues us from God's anger that is coming. What is that talking about? Okay. First Thessalonians? Yes, yeah. chapter 1. Yeah. You don't have God's wrath to come at the end of verse 10? Right. Oh, right. yeah. Right here it says uh, the God's wrath is the, uh, the seven last plagues. That's one possibility. Other people suggested he was thinking, speaking to the Jews about the destruction of Jerusalem. But what is, is, is he talking about God's wrath? Does no, it doesn't say God's wrath. It just says the wrath to come in the RSV. The and what does that mean? Well, that's the question. It's just the wrath to come. It's not God's wrath. It just says the wrath to come. What Even in the message, it doesn't. We're told in the very end, the elements will melt with fervent heat. That sounds rather wrathful to me. <laughs> we think so, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it turns out that Thessalonians is going to speak about the wrath you know, on several occasions in these two small books. Well, it's interesting that if you've had the opportunity to go through the Bible and consider especially God's wrath, you'll discover something very interesting. You'll discover that God, God's wrath, if that's what we're talking about here, we don't know for sure this is talking about God's wrath, but God's wrath is simply his turning away in loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway. They're running away from him as fast as they can go, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. Do you think that's what Paul had in mind when he wrote those words? I like the Message Bible. Right on the end it said, who rescued us from certain doom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of who rescued up. us from certain doom. Are you saying that if we're left to ourselves, we will eventually do ourselves in? Exactly. <laughs> you know, before Paul came, wasn't that happening? What, wrath? What? Well, because, because the religion wasn't there, the religion of Paul wasn't there. Yeah. So if... if you, you're, are you saying people were dying? Well, okay, so there must be something different happening here than what was happening before, mm -hmm. wouldn't you think? So if, if Paul comes in and brings in God, mm -hmm. what was happening before when God wasn't there? So Good question. Um, there must be something different between the f before and and the one he's talking yeah. about when it comes, when it comes, is it because maybe they've been warned or something and, and then God leaves even further than it was in the first place? Well, I'll let you think about that because we're going to come back to it at the end of the lesson. Okay. Look now at First Thessalonians, the first three verses of chapter 1. Now we know pretty much who wrote this book, but he generously says, from Paul... Silas and Timothy, to the people of the church in Thessalonica who belong to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be yours. We always thank God for you all and always mention you in our prayers. For we remember before our God and Father how you put your, patience, your faith into patience, practice, how your love made you work so hard, and how you, your hope in our Lord Jesus Christ is firm. So what What's he saying there at the, at the beginning of this new letter? Well, he's talking about faith and love and hope. These are the things they're doing right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we notice first that Paul greeted the Thessalonians by the traditional Greek, uh, I'm sorry, he greeted the Thessalonians by changing the traditional Greek greeting the traditional Greek greeting, just a way to say hello, hello, hi, rain. That was the word, hi, rain. And into the, Christi into the Christian greeting that Paul used, and that was charis. 
So it's not very much different. And I wonder, how do you suppose people responded if when Paul walked down the street and said, Cars, instead of Kyrie? Uh, why did he do that? Ch well, Kairos, did he change Kairos the word? means grace. Uh-huh. Kyrie just means hello. Oh, he wanted to say grace. Yeah. He was giving... You wonder a, how the pagan people responded to he that. He was given a short sermon. Uh, of <laughs> course, yes. Well, it was probably like, bless you. Uh -huh. And yeah. most people don't get mad if you say bless you in a greeting. No. Especially after you sneeze. Yeah. Well, Paul also used the word peace. And I, I suspect, and we're going to look at this again a little bit later, I suspect that he had in mind all the implications of the, the Hebrew word for peace, which is shalom. 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 Yeah. Well, notice that in taking, talking about these key phrases or words so often mentioned in connection with the gospel, Paul specifically talked about what those traits accomplish. Faith works. What else did he say? Labor of love. Labor, I mean love labors, it does something, and hope makes us steadfast, makes us stand firm, right? So this is not, okay, let's sit back and philosophize about Christian characteristics. Paul is saying these Christian characteristics do what? They function. They work. They, they function. They, they make... This is action. These are action verbs, okay? That's amazing. Um, you don't hear that too much. Faith works. Love does what? Labor. Labor. Labors. Labor of love. And um, hope, of hope has Faith. endurance and patience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, look at verse 4, since we're trying to get through the whole chapter here before we run out of time. Our brothers and sisters, we know that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own. Okay? What do you suppose are the implications of that? Now, that whosoever will may come. Yes. Well, you know that there are people who have taken this verse to an extreme. Uh, probably some on both sides. But the ones that are most, most well known are those who go all the way to predestination. And what does predestination mean? Well, I was reading um, about, I believe it's Calvinism, mm -hmm. and I was reading some of their uh, five points, I think they have, and they kind of take your breath away. People are chosen, and you have, there's nothing you can do about God's mm -hmm. choice. If you're chosen, um, you're chosen. And if you're not, no matter how good you are, you are not chosen. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you're in church means that you are chosen because the chosen led you to church. And so if you're not in church, that means you're not chosen because you haven't... I, it, was, it was very confusing yeah. when I got into it. Well, I've heard it presented in a more ge general way, a more generic kind of way, saying if you're good, you may or may not be chosen by God. If you're bad, you're just proving that you haven't been chosen by God. So you've got to be good, because then at least you have a chance of being the chosen, right? You may have a 50-50 chance if you're good. Yeah. Well, as a Christian, it w has your life been made different by the fact that God has chosen you? You know, isn't this something a little different than usual? Because... Um, People usually come up and say, you've got to come and approach God. Mm -hmm. And then you got Paul doing the other way around saying, you've been chosen by God. Come with me. Mm -hmm. You know, well, you've you got to put this up against John 3.16. Yes. Which says, whosoever, mm -hmm. anybody, anytime, any place. Mm -hmm. That doesn't sound, that doesn't, that yeah. you either have to say that all of those people are chosen where you got to say the chosen language doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a good point. Paul doesn't say that because you're chosen, the other people are not chosen. Yeah. I mean, it's, they can be recognized as chosen also. He doesn't mm -hmm. exclude. Mm -hmm. But why would, why would people grab on to that 
idea and really try to make a big deal out of it? Are they trying to avoid responsibility for changing their behavior or their attitudes? It's They're almost probably. like they give up. Well, what? You know, because it, what's going to happen is going to happen. How does this relate to the once saved, always saved idea? Well, that isn't quite the same. No, it's because not the you same. Gotta, you got to make a choice to be saved or not be or, or forget the whole thing. And then once you're saved, you're always saved. So you still make a choice, but uh, this Calvinistic stuff is, is you know, you're, you're predestined to be changed mm -hmm. or the saved. So The chosen people feel quite superior. And the unchosen people are looked at. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of an experience. Those who feel that they're not chosen are very disappointed and very down. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not talked to and they're not um, in the in-group. It's sort of like Facebook. You're either a friend or you're not a friend, you know? And <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, it just is so human. It's another human yeah. type. Well, I wonder if this, this knowledge, this is just knowledge that we know of, but we can't really know. I mean, because we believe that God knows the future, right? Mm -hmm. He knows what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. He knows everything that's going to happen. Yes. But um, um, that's in a different realm than we are as far as knowing what's going to happen. I mean, we won't actually know until after it happens, right? Mm -hmm. And as soon as we know it had happened, you can look back and see what's going on, mm -hmm. but not before. Well, our, our, our criteria, hopefully, for what we believe is the Scripture. So let me read you a, two or three passages from Scripture and see how this relates to the ideas of predestination, once saved, always saved, that kind of stuff. First of all, Joshua 24, 15. Joshua 24, 15. If you're not willing to serve him, this is Joshua speaking to the people at, at, just before his death. If you're not willing to serve God, decide today whom you will serve. So who's making the decision? You are. You are. The gods your ancestors worship in the Mesopotamia or the gods of the Amorites, and whose land you're now living, as for my family and me, we will serve the Lord. Who's making the decision? We are, right? He says he is. Well, look at 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. Who wants everyone, he's talking about God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to know the truth. How many does he want to save? Everyone. Everyone. That should be pretty clear. Well, what about Revelation 3.20? Listen, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them and they will eat with me. I stand at the door and knock. What's he saying? If anyone. What about the, what's an, and have you ever looked carefully at the pictures that are drawn of this experience? Where's the doorknob? On the inside. There isn't one. The door has to be open from the inside. Hmm. Um, okay. You just said all this, but I can still come back to you and say, do you think God knows if you're going to make the choice or not? Yes. He knows it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so somebody can jump on that line and say, okay, you're predestined. No well, matter he, what you read about that. Yeah. But I'm just saying that, you know, this kind of information is God knowledge, just not finite knowledge. Mm -hmm. And, um, and... You know, you make your choices, you're still, it's up to you. That's mm -hmm. the way it is in the practical setting, in our level. So how do these texts relate to a couple more found in Hebrews? Look at Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6. Well, you know, as a teacher, you can give an assignment in class. Mm -hmm. And you know who's going to get it in and who isn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you're dealing with high schoolers. So yeah. Right? Well, look at Hebrews 4, starting, I'm sorry, Hebrews 6, starting with verse 4. For how can those who abandon their faith be brought back to repent again? They were once in God's light. They tasted heaven's gift and received their share of the Holy Spirit. They knew from experience that God's word is good, and they had felt the powers of the coming age. And then they abandoned their faith. 
it is impossible to bring them back to repent again because they are again crucifying the Son of God and exposing him to public shame. Just that's that's the human that's the human expression of why there was no savior for the angels. Mm -hmm. so just a minute. They already knew what it was to be with God, to live with him, to be there. There was nothing that he could show them more. Mm -hmm. So there's but humanity was deceived. Mm -hmm. There was more that they could learn. And so he came down to show them that. But there was nothing they could show the angels. That's why there was no savior. The the guy went out uh, from his father and li and ended up living with the pigs and he came back. Mm -hmm. um, I it's possible. Well, you go out and experience and you say, I mean, even I have had kids that their family had a business and they wanted no part of it and they went out and got a job someplace else. They came running right back when they, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you have to go and learn. Yeah, yeah. but don't you know, that, don't you think there's a point where your, your glass is this high and it fills up to the top and then you can't put any more on it because it'll drip over type of thing. And are you going to say it's still possible to get more water in that glass? Uh, how am I, how's that got to do with the guy because going living the angels, with it? When the angels, um, I think they, they saw all they could see and still they chose not to go with God. Well, they didn't know evil before. Well, I, they yeah, they, not before, but there's a point where they decided not to go with God. And there's no way that they'll come back. Well, let's look at no some way. more verses. I've got several more. This is Hebrews 10, 26. For there is no longer any sacrifice that will take away sins if we purposely go on sinning after the truth has been made known to us. Does that sound like it's once saved, kind of always saved kind of thing? Well, what you're saying almost like this once lost, always lost there. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that grieving the spirit till the spirit leaves you? Isn't that what that's talking about? Well, but you know, if you if you make a pact, then no matter what you do, you're never going to make a decision for God, mm -hmm. and you that's complete. Is there any point to go any further after You've that? You've made it on all the available evidence. Yeah, and you've decided not that's to. Right. Exactly. Well, you know, maybe if the guy... In spite of the all available animals. Yeah. If the guy came back from b living with the pigs back to his father and God, and then maybe if he left again, he would never come back. I don't well, know. I would give everyone one chance. <laughs> here's what Jesus said. This is Matthew 18. I'm going to read verses 21 and 22. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, if my brother keeps on sinning against me, how many times do I have to forgive him? Seven times? No, not seven times, answered Jesus, but 70 times seven. But these guys wanted to be forgiven. I okay. mean, you could, make a, you could make a point there that, okay, you can forgive the devil so many times that he can live throughout eternity. Well, so what is the role of God and what's our role in the plan of salvation? Oh. The only thing we can do is look and wish and if we see what he says and we say I want that with all sincerity mm -hmm. that's all we can do he has to provide the the will he has to provide the power he does everything except make put the will where it's supposed right. to be in other words the one thing we can do that we do do in the plan of salvation is to cast our vote. That's right. We make a choice. We may not even be able to do what we're choosing. Absolutely not. But we can make a choice. And that's the part that God says, I'm not going to violate your freedom. That part's up to you. I will not do that on your behalf. Well, do what we... can we do to create life? We can't. We can't do anything. We can't do anything. To create comes... life? No. No, we... because Jesus said, what did he claim about himself? that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. he, it comes from Him. What can you do to, to create it yourself? 
you can't. There's no way. He's willing to, well, however you got the life in the first place, he's willing to renew it again. And that's, that's all he can do. But you've got to want it, and you've got to mm -hmm. kind of want to want whatever he's got to give you to be saved into. I mean, you, you need all that. Exactly the choice we have to make. So our choice is we say, God, I want to know you. Is that the choice? Yeah, that's part of it. Uh, the, the word that's used in the Bible to describe that process is, is faith or trust. We God. must we must reach a place where we say, God, instead of trusting any other means or person or whatever, I trust you. And I want to trust you. I don't really now, but I want to trust you. And that's all God needs to start. That will open the door. Mm -hmm. Okay. So why would anybody refuse God's salvation? Why would anybody? Because they don't like it. Are they just completely perverse? They don't like it. Why did Lucifer rebel in heaven? They want their own way. They don't want anybody that may change them in any way. Selfishness. They, they want to be the top person. Well, it's interesting that Lucifer, after he came to the earth and became Satan, accused God of being arbitrary, exacting, vengeful, unforgiving, and severe, and a tyrant, and a whole bunch of other things. If he really believed those things back in heaven, do you think he would have dared to rebel? No. Nope. If you believe God was an arbitrary, exacting, vengeful tyrant, would you dare to right in his presence rebel in his face? Wait a minute, wait a minute. You said that if you found out he was that way, you would then rebel. You've said that several times. So now you're going, you hold you're on going around. No, I don't know what, say what you said again. I'm not sure if I got you. Well, will you, won't you rebel against any kind of a person that is arbitrary, that is revengeful, that, that uh -huh. is a tyrant? Won't you rebel against him? And you're just asking yeah. the question that they wouldn't if that Well, was but if you're, if you're in heaven and you don't know any other place to go, you're going to live in fear. You're not going to, you're not going to try to rebel because you're going to figure out, you got to figure out that this guy's going to zap you. Well, I don't know if you can separate fear from rebellion, though. Well, can no, you, you can't. I, I think, I, well, I mean, we've, read, we've read the passage here on a number of occasions. A sullen submission leads to the character of a rebel. So Satan knew God good enough to know that if he rebelled, God would not kill him. Exactly. He knew God was so loving. But at the other hand, you said that if he, he, God was a tyrant, then, pe then the spirit of rebellion would come up. Mm -hmm. didn't so they, you're saying both things. Or didn't this no. grow, though? Wasn't he initially jealous? Yeah, self-centered. Well, yeah. you know, that's one of the issues, yes. Yeah. He got, the, got to the other a bit later. Yeah. You asked, what can we do? Mm -hmm. Christ Object Lessons 159.3. We can only consent for Christ to accomplish the work. Then the language of the soul will be, Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is thy property. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. Wow. Exactly. That's a statement of trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Just a yeah. statement of trust. Yeah. Well, back to Thessalonica. How, how do you think Paul actually convinced them to give up their old pagan religions, to believe in Jesus Christ, to believe that he's coming back again. That's a radical change. But even... And he convinced not only Gentiles, but Jews. Do you, do you think it's a... At that point, is it the Spirit speaking to them? I mean, what could he offer? 
I mean, we, we're not really there to see what he actually said to them to turn them around. Right. I mean, what could he possibly say? Uh, how much were they, were they acquainted with the Jewish faith, the, mm -hmm. the history of the Jewish uh, nation and all that stuff? Mm -hmm. He had seen their history, and they had seen their history. They knew what their philosophy had gotten them so far, and he gave them something that was better and they chose for the better. Mm -hmm. You know, truth has a certain ring to it, and he also had the Old Testament. So yeah. if they studied the Old Testament, they would have seen Christ coming all the way through it. And, be, and there was that evidence, the scripture evidence, and then there was the evidence of the witnesses that saw Christ uh, rise from the dead. So um, truth doesn't need any propping up. It just people will be convinced uh, people who want to know the truth and then that forms the strong uh, beginnings of a church is for people who are really seeking of the truth so he had the word and he had witnesses and he had the but truth wasn't the, mm -hmm. when they wasn't reading the scriptures part of the Jewish religion yes did they have any kind of scriptures that was part of their religion to make them trust probably that probably it's interesting that Paul and I, I've asked this on a number of occasions, so I've never gotten an answer. There's a very interesting answer found in Ellen White's book, the, uh, the Acts of the Apostles, on page 225 to 227. And she just says, Paul started through the Old Testament, starting with Genesis 3.15, the promise about the woman versus the serpent. And he goes on through, and he mentions a whole, she mentions quite a number of Old Testament texts, a bunch of them in Psalms, some very important ones in Isaiah, Jeremiah, other places like that, Zechariah. There are already quite a number of texts in the Old Testament that talk about things that the Messiah was going to come and do. And he u apparently used those things. And probably these are the texts that Paul used, I'm sorry, that Jesus used on the road to Emmaus. Exactly what I was but would, yeah. but would these Thessalonians, mm -hmm. would, they, would they accept that, that Bible or that, those scriptures like uh, we would? Well, of course, that's a, that's a question. And when um, Ellen White was talking about that, was she talking, who was she talking about as far as Paul showing this to whom? To who? Yeah. You know, so... Well, when which we've got two audiences. He's talking, trying to talk to Jews, and he's trying to talk to Gentiles, and they both live in Thessalonica. Well, I can see how the Jews will work out, because he mm -hmm. can go through the scriptures, and they're very acquainted with that. But what about the non-Jewish, the Gentile people? I mean, well, you know, we're, we're Gentiles, and we've we've read uh, the scriptures, and it's really supernatural when you start reading how. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. But that's but, different. I mean, we've got we've had the Bible grow up with us in our generations, but back then, us. well, no, for a I'm lot new of to them, the Bible, and also yes, some churches, but you know what the Bible was before. I, Even I, though you know it was the word of God, mm -hmm. not really. And well, when okay. my um, <laughs> and my relative gave me, uh, my sister gave me a Bible, and she uh, gave me the New Testament. Well, what good is the New Testament without the Old Testament? And some people never study the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So even if you're a Gentile and you start reading this book, you go, oh. Wow, wow, wow. It's unlike any other book that's written. There was a lot of secular history yeah. that, that the Thessalonians could look into and understand. And he brought in the biblical stories, the, the stories that of the Old Testament. Much of that was just real history that went on with Israel. Mm -hmm. And he could point to that factual stuff in the Old Testament and develop a faith in the Old Testament and then go from there to Christ. Oh, was it? it wasn't, they weren't making a big leap into nothing. Well, you know, the Jews were supposed to share the Old Testament. Sure. And they didn't. They didn't share it with the other people and he was finally sharing it. Right. Paul was okay. an educated man who mm -hmm. was very sharp and I think you'll find he was able to compare and contrast all through with yeah. his prior knowledge of education as a young man and his life experience, just like we do today. Well, wasn't he slapped up the side of the head and given a, uh, a correct translation of the Old Testament that from what 
It, was he the one on the road to Damascus? No, or Damascus. Damascus? Damascus. Damascus, on the road to Damascus, yes. He's got a new slant yeah. on a few things. So he, yeah. Uh, I think there's a hint into what went on here in verse 5. Okay, uh, let's go to that. For we brought the good news to you, not with words only, but also with power and the Holy Spirit, and with complete conviction of its truth. You know how we lived when we were with you. It was for your own good. Now these, as we mentioned in our earlier lessons, this, these passages are reading now, we're reading now are almost certainly the very first part of the New Testament to be written. You mean this book? This book, and, and we're now at the beginning of it. In power and in the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we asked at one time, do you think they had the, the, the fire on the, on, the tongues of fire. Mm -hmm. I see no reason why I should say no. No. I think they had that. They had that kind of, of demonstration for in, in their church also. But well, we see here that Paul is not only thankful, he's rejoicing that the Thessalonians had not only accepted a theoretical message, which they could easily have done. Sure. Oh yeah, we believe that. That's fine. Bye. But also they had exhibited God's power in their lives. Timothy had reported that the changes which had taken place in them could not be explained except by divine intervention. Prayers were answered, lives were changed. And I can't help thinking about the lady that I gave Bible studies to back when I was attending Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. And before that started, one day I was just standing in the hallway getting some books out of my locker there in, in the school and she came by and she said, is anything happening in your church? You know, here you are at a public university and you're, you know, getting your books out and you don't even know anybody's behind you and they, is anything happening in your church? Yeah. And I said, you know, the only way you can find that out is to come see for yourself. And about three months later, she was a baptized member of the Adventist <laughs> church. The Message Bible puts it, I think, very nicely. The Holy Spirit puts steel in your convictions. Right. So yeah. whatever happened, whether it was tongues of fire, something did happen, and it was powerful. Right. And um, it it added to to the words of Paul. Yeah. How would you know if the Holy Spirit was working in the local in your church or even in your own life? Well, one interesting place to look at that is Galatians 5. Notice the contrast, starting with verse 19. What human nature does is quite plain. It shows itself in immoral, filthy, and indecent actions. In worship of idols and witchcraft, people become enemies, and they fight, they become jealous, angry, and ambitious. Does that sound at all familiar? Mm -hmm. They separate into parties and groups. They're envious, get drunk, have orgies, and do other things like these. I want you to know, as I have before, those who do these things will not possess the kingdom of God. But the Spirit produces, and this is the part we usually read, but the Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. There is no law against such things as these. And you, so that might be a start, right? And you know a person by his fruits. So is a person's fruits the first paragraph, or is a person's fruits the second paragraph? Is he a Christian or isn't he? Mm -hmm. There's a big contrast there, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we only read one side, you know, the point is, comes out stronger when you read the other side. Yeah. What, what, what is the work of the Holy Spirit? This isn't a lesson of the Holy Spirit, but I think it's a good to review this every once in a while. Work what is the work of the Holy Spirit? To, to make us the person that God intended us to be when he created us in our mother's womb. Well, the Holy Spirit, I like to suggest to you, works at four different levels. He keeps us alive by making all the natural processes of the human body works, and that's Acts 17, 28. But I like this statement. It's one short sentence from Ellen White, Review and Herald, December 2, 1890, paragraph 15. Every pulsation of the heart is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God. Does that tell us that God has something to do with actually keeping us alive? Well, he's got a lot of fingers all over him. Yeah, yeah, well. Have you got something to thank him about <laughs> moment by moment? Very direct yes. link. 
Then two, he woos us and draws us to himself. John 6, and 12, 32. The Holy Spirit is constantly trying to draw people into God. Three, he convicts us of the truth leading to conversion and baptism. Okay? He convicts of the truth leading to conversion and baptism. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5. We just read it. And four, he gives us gifts so we can more effectively carry the gospel to others and build up the church. So you can see how each one of these activities, and the Holy Spirit works with the angels, each one of these activities builds on the other one. And that last one would be 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 11, and Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. And if you'd like to have some of this material yourself, uh, it's available on our website, theox.org, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and you can get our handout, download it anytime you want. Well, can you see the fruit of the Spirit at work in the lives of Christians around you, as well as in your own life? Do you sometimes do things that show love that you would never have considered doing before you became a Christian? Or you would never expect people who aren't Christians to do? If you say no, what, do you, what, what would you say back? I would say you need to learn about the Holy Spirit. You need to learn about Christianity. Well, then how do I do that? Scripture. Scripture? That's what we're doing here. By beholding, you become changed. Yep. It's the only, that's the only mechanism, that's the only thing you can do. Is you can go and say, I want to get in touch with you. I want to know you. I want to live with well, you. Well, it's nice that you answered one of your questions there. Yeah. You just fire off these questions. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, everybody could take a crack at them, but mm -hmm. um, it would be nice to... Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, well, I'd like to contrast that getting to know Jesus with trying to get over and quit sinning. Mm -hmm. quit, quit doing this or quit so doing that. enough to come to Jesus. Sometimes. Or even, even as, a, as, a, as, an, as an effort. Yeah. Because it's only as you get in touch with Him that the desires for those things fall off. Mm -hmm. And you won't have a life in Christ and cherished iniquities for very long. One or the other is going to is going to win. That's well said. They can't occupy the same space. No, that's you right. You can't serve God and mammon. That's right. right. Well, you know, Gary, you're doing so much all the time. You're practically working yourself to death for God, keeping LLBN going and keeping all this other. Well, I mean, it's. Uh, you're making me bigger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, we do things and we don't even realize. Sometimes I think Christians don't realize what they are doing mm -hmm. because they're just so immersed in it. Well, know? let's talk about looking at this process in a slightly different way. A lot of research has been put into what happens. How, how do you get people to change their health habits? That's a little bit like changing your religious beliefs, right? People come to believe something without, sometimes people come to believe something without actually acting on it. Most people in the United States these days believe that cigarette smoking is dangerous, but many smokers continue to smoke. There are three steps necessary before we adopt any new behavior. First, we must recognize the importance of doing that thing. Then we must change our attitude about it. We must really think, yeah, this is something that I ought to do. And finally, we must put it into practice. Well, you know, I have a nephew. He's not an Adventist, but he has certainly watched the TV programs, 3ABN, LB, LLBN, the health shows. And he has taken steps in his life, and he feels immensely better. Mm -hmm. it, it helps his chemical imbalances and, and everything. And he says, thank you so much for telling me, and thank you. And I tell him, Mike, it's not me at all. I mean, I tell this, I can tell things to everybody or whatever. You are doing it. And he faithfully follows and he eats on time. He drinks his water. He exercises. He does. I said, it is strictly you that are do, is doing this. So basically, you could tell someone something and they will never follow it. But You, the, you need to add something to your spiel. You can tell him, God is working with you. 
Mm. But God's well, got to have somebody to work with. <laughs> yeah, of course. That's the thing. How, do, how do you think Paul brought deep conviction to the Thessalonians? Can we bring deep conviction to somebody else? Or is that exclusively the work of the Holy Spirit? That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay. If so, what is our work? He had so little time with them. Mm -hmm, that's true. So he couldn't have done... Do we have to have a deep conviction about the gospel before we can bring a deep conviction to somebody else? I, I don't think you can give something you don't have. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, well, when you listen to speeches, you know, when people have conviction, they're better speeches than mm -hmm. the ones that just Unless read really something, yeah. you know, Actors. type of thing. So there's power. Well, Paul wanted the Thessalonian believers to have clearly in mind what it meant to live a Christian life. And here's one of the biggest challenges in this chapter. Look at verses 6 and 7. You imitated us and the Lord. And even though you suffered much, you received the message with the joy that comes from the Holy Spirit. So you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. So what is it saying there? These people hadn't had the privilege of seeing Jesus in person. They only heard about him while he, was here, I mean, while he was here on this earth. So Paul did his best to represent the kind of life that Jesus lived. Mm -hmm. Thus, he was able to call them to live lives like himself and his fellow workers, in the same way as they sought to live lives like Jesus. Apparently, in the process, they were suffering considerably, and they became examples for the other people around them. And that's the way the Christian community is supposed to grow. However, however he accomplished this, it does seem that Paul was successful. The Thessalonians were imitating him and his colleagues and were becoming examples to others around them. Paul rejoiced that the gospel was actually working in the lives of the Thessalonians. They had even become examples for others to follow. Was this an example of the basic principles describing how the human mind works? And how does the human mind work? By beholding we become changed. There you go, Norm. Great Con verse 555, this is the way that people are changed. Have you ever met someone whose Christian example was such that you would feel safe following his or her example? Mm -hmm. Don't we usually tell people, you know, don't, don't follow me, don't follow anybody else in the church, look to Jesus. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Yes. If I don't imitate Christ, but don't follow me. <laughs> yeah. But let's be truthful. As human beings, we need role models. Mm -hmm. We need to see something actually working in somebody else's life. It's a lot more convincing off our argument if you see someone's gospels and someone's teachings actually working in people's lives. Sometimes we need counsel and guidance especially when difficult times come along. Furthermore, whether we like it or not, people are looking at us and our influence is impacting their lives every day. So how many veteran Christians do you know in whom you can see the life of Jesus being lived out? You know, there used to be more in the world than there are today. More veteran Christians who are actually living out Christ-like lives. Mm -hmm. I think. Well, if there were a number of people actually living lives like the life of Jesus from, on a human per, uh, level, would it lead to the final events in this earth's history? Is that the kind of people who become a part of the 144,000? Mm -hmm. Likely, huh? Even Paul recognized that. Uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't saying, you know, I'm taking the place of Jesus. I'm the worst of sinners. I'm the least of all the saints. 1 Thessalonians 1, 15 and Ephesians 3, 8. Why do you suppose Paul made such statements? Should we be making similar statements? Would that convince the people to whom we are witnessing of the power of the gospel to change their lives? He says, well, if I don't see any change in your life, how can I believe that what you're telling me is going to change my life, right? Well, we do not know exactly why the Thessalonians were suffering because of their new religion. 
Maybe they were being persecuted just as the early church was being persecuted in Acts 8. We don't know. But the question is how many of us would continue to be really faithful Christians in the face of persecution? Do we suffer at all because of our beliefs? We're going to find out. Going to find out. There's a lot of people whose families have turned their backs on people who become Christians. Oh, I met a young fellow, um, and I also met a young gal uh, who came from Haiti, and her family was Catholic, and they wanted to, um, when they came to America, wanted to leave her there because she had become a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. So people are being persecuted today. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Certainly in some places in the world. It's interesting to observe that in the places where there's persecution going on, the church is growing the fastest. Always has. India is an example, isn't it? Yeah, today. Yeah, it's an official thing, you're not to change your religion and yeah. they are changing it. Why is it, as was stated hundreds of years ago, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Why is that? I, I think the fact that people are looking for something to really believe in. Mm -hmm. And when they see somebody who really believes in it mm -hmm. to the point that they'll lose their life to defend it, yeah. that's when they go take a second look. Also, they're, they're probably not satisfied with the status quo in right. their, in their uh, in their economic and social uh, condition, and they see, hey, this person was true blue in spite of. I mean, there's, there's very few people that actually speak the truth in spite of whatever is going on. It's true. I know a couple of people who were partially involved in a story where a pastor was awakened in the middle of the night by a man who came to his door, and as soon as the pastor opened the door, he stuck a gun at his head. And he says, I want to call your wife and your kids line him up on the wall over there. He said, I want you to tell me, do you believe in God? Do you believe in this? Do you believe that? And he went through the, down through the beliefs of, of Christianity. And then he said, okay, now he says, I'm gonna ask you those same questions again. And the first time you say yes, I'm gonna pull the trigger. This is a true story. I know, know the people involved. And the guy said, do you believe in God? And what would you say? With the wife and kids watching while the gun was to his head? Yep. That's what's happening right now in certain parts of the world, no question. What did he say? Well, in this case, the guy says, I, I'm not, I'm not going to die you know, denying my faith. He said yes. And the guy took his gun and threw it across the room. He says, I didn't think there was anyone left in the world who really, really believed what he taught. Isn't that incredible? Some of our Korean members experienced that when the North Korea invaded. Husbands were pulled out and never seen again. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be easy to convince a group of idol-worshiping Thessalonians that a friend of yours, back in Judea, had died and come back to life again? In light of the problems that the Jews were causing in many areas of the Mediterranean world, would you be inclined to suggest this was a crazy Jewish idea? Not if you start giving them Bible study. <laughs> well, yeah, Bible study is a good meaning for us. It may not have had for them. The Thessalonian believers, now I'm reading from Ellen White, the Acts of the Apostles, page 256. The Thessalonian believers were true missionaries. Their hearts burned with zeal for their Savior, who had delivered them from the fear of the wrath to come. I told you we are going to talk about the wrath to come. They felt like they had been delivered from the wrath to come. Through the grace of Christ, a marvelous transformation had taken place in their lives, and the word of the Lord, as spoken through them, was accompanied with power. Hearts were won by the truths presented, and souls were added to the number of believers. So is there a direct relationship between this wrath that he's talking about and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his second coming? Is the hope of the second coming an essential part of Christianity? I think most of us would say yes to that. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 17, John 11, 24 and 25, Daniel 12, 2. Would there have been any reason for Christ to come, live the life he did the first time, 
and die the death he died if there was no plan for a second coming? What would, what would be the point? Well, think about it. Yeah, but the the issues for the for the universe oh. might well might well have said they have been satisfied, yeah. even even though you're nobody saying, down here. Basically, you're saying the demonstration could have been given for the whole universe without having any impact on human beings. Right. But I'm saying that the same kind of evidence that the universe was looking for would be the evidence for us. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, everyone who's ever lived on the hist in the history of our world will one day be alive at the same time. <clears throat> Some inside the city and the rest outside the city. And in, in light of that, look at Ellen White's comments. If you have the book Acts of the Apostles, read pages 255 and 256. It's a very interesting section. Is it fair for the world to expect to see a change in Christians? Yes. Gandhi is reported to have said, I, ha I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Pretty sad, huh? Yeah, it is. Well, there are exceptions. He was, yeah. yeah. Well, what would you say about your church? What would he say about your church? If you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Well, I mean, let's be honest. The world has never seen an event like what we believe is going to happen at the Second Coming. It has never happened before. But the Second Coming is not going to change minds. No. The minds will be made up prior to that. Well done, yes. So are we convinced sufficiently by the evidence that we have, do we have solid evidence that, would, that is, is convincing enough so that we're going to be ready? That's the real question. Well, Paul in, his, in this first chapter talks about peace, faith, <clears throat> hope, love. Um, we, haven't, we don't have time to go through all those things and what it talks about, but if you get our hand out, you'll be happy to, you'll be, you'll be delighted to see the results there. If you read 1 Thessalonians 1, it's clear that Paul believed what he taught. And we hope that you have the same convictions. See you next week.